healthy relationships thrive in authentic humility. Oh, much love, 12 Stone. Good to be with you on this Lord's Day, celebrating Father's Day. Hey, let's just do it one more time across all nine campuses online on the count of three. Let's just give it up one more time for all the dads. One, two, three. Come on. Yeah. And all the more to our Father in heaven, how much we love you, Lord, how good you have been to us, how good he is. Let me just remind you, dads, if you're, if you're listening in, you're hanging out on one of the campuses, or maybe, maybe you're just spiritually unresolved, and you're like, nah, I, don't, I don't even know if I get this stuff or buy into the things you guys say you believe. I, just want, to, I want you to know that you have a Father in heaven. You, you are not alone. You are not on your own. Stay in the spiritual journey. And God has stuff for us today. I'm fired up to get after this. We're in week two of three. And where are we going? Well, let's just get right to it. Save people. Three prayers with three practices for building healthy relationships. And when I, when I say safe people, when I say safe, think healthy. When I, when I say unsafe, think unhealthy or dysfunctional. And, and, and this idea of safe people, well, it comes from a book uh, in the early 90s written by a couple of Christian authors, and it, it's still out today. It's a powerful, profound book. Helped me break through a whole bunch of the dysfunction of the family of origin that I grew up in and just figure out how to do life and, more importantly, relationships. But beyond all that, listen, the core of this, while it's inspired by Safe People book, it is rooted in God's Word. God ordained relationships. He created you for relationship, and God gives us wisdom for how to live healthy in relationship. So we're going to dive in and, and unpack God's design for us in this. And, and I gave you this thought uh, last week, and we'll just stay with it in the series. Safe people are mostly healthy people who help us become who God intends us to be. Though not perfect, they are honest without being condemning. Maybe we say, what are safe people? Well, they're honest without being condemning. Kind of touched on that last week. They practice what they preach, authentic to their values. Hint, hint, where we might be going today. And they know how to give and take without being narcissistic or codependent. Hint, hint, one more week to go. And we tapped into the Old Testament story narrative of Isaac and Rebecca and Esau and Jacob and gracious sakes, that family is dysfunctional, which should make you feel good about your family if you come from a dysfunctional family. And then we're going to sit a little bit in the New Testament and, and the Holy Spirit's going to give us insight. And if you listen in, I'm telling you, if you'll, if you'll lean in today, God will awaken some things that are so simply profound and it will transform your relationships. So get a hold of this because you, listen, you do not have to live in the dysfunction of your family of origin as I came from and, and, and no, no, I'm not dissing my family. I'm just saying when we live in a culture of such brokenness and breakdown, you don't have to live there. You don't have to be stuck. God, by his word and his wisdom, and then if you'll surrender to him, the Holy Spirit in you, an authentic relationship with the living God, God will transform your life. You can live in healthy relationship. Don't settle for what the world is offering. So we'll tap into the New Testament. We'll tap into a little bit of my love since uh, post-succession hobby, which is kind of racing around a track. And, and then I just sometimes things need to be said. This isn't in scripture, but it should be. Life is too short to drive slow cars. Can I get an amen? That's all I'm saying. So we'll have a little bit of fun and maybe enjoyed seeing some cars on the way and on the way out that, that dad set up. So let's get into this a little bit where we left off last week. Now last week I gave you one word to drive the conversation and the word was honest. Remember where we left off? See, Honesty is at the core of healthy relationships. Emotional honesty. Relational honesty. Honest with yourself. Honest to God. And emotional dishonesty. Pretense. Is at the core of unhealthy relationships. Let's not make it more complicated. It starts one word, honesty. If I were to give a one word for today, the second of our three weeks, the word would be humble. 
across all the nine campuses online. Everybody say that word with me on the count of three, loud and proud. The word is humble. One, two, three, humble. And now take a moment, look at the person alongside you, and just say, be humble. Just tell them, be humble. Be hum don't do that arrogantly. That's not helpful. That's, yeah, don't, don't be full of yourself while you say, be humble. <laughs> See, I wish you would write this next line down. I really do. If you're taking notes, putting it on your phone, whatever the case, I wish you would get this next sentence in your head and in your heart. Healthy relationships thrive in authentic humility. Healthy relationships thrive in authentic humility. By the way, if you are honest, you will be humble. See, if you're honest to God, honest with yourself and honest with others, you will be humble. Because honest to God, he's perfect, you're not. You will be humble. If you're honest with yourself, you're not all that you desire to be. You can't even be the person you want to be consistently. So if you're honest with yourself, you'll be humble. If you're honest with the value of others, you'll value others like you value yourself. You will be humble. Honest people are humble. So when we leave off with honest last week and talk about humble this week, these are the qualities of healthy, safe people. This is the wisdom of God and the word of God and the power of God. If you will tap in and surrender to Jesus and lean on him and look to him, he will transform you relationally from the inside out, no matter where you came from or where you are. Don't settle for less than God has. But we all battle with this. So I want to give you a story. Let me paint a picture for you. I'll paint the picture and then we'll get into the weight of the teaching. Marcia and I have two different kind of ideas of what's fun. For me, I want to race her on the track. For her, she wants to do a marathon race. I don't understand it. I do respect it. But I don't get it. They, there's engines. Why run it? <laughs> you can drive it. But anyhow, that said, she qualified, uh, some of you had heard, for the Boston Marathon. She finished it recently, a few weeks ago. Here, here she is running across the finish line. God bless her, honey. I, Marsha, well done. Good for you. Crazy good. Kudos, baby. And then we had to come home. And stay with me. I want to tell a story here. Uh, I, I, here's first an admission. I don't travel well. I'll just, I'll just own it. I, 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 don't, I don't travel well. I, I, here's the problem. It's just exhausting and waiting, and I'm impatient, and everything in travel is just slow. Somebody's slow in the left lane. It's the equivalent of that for me. See, just emotionally getting packed up from the hotel and then getting in, packed in the rental car and then getting the rental car and then driving to the off-site rental car place and getting to the right place and then, and then getting gas on the way and then dropping the car off off-site and then unloading your luggage and then getting to the right bus and getting on the right bus that gets you to the right terminal for the right Delta Airlines and, and, and then and then getting your baggage taken care of and then getting your ticketing right and then, and then getting through TSA. Don't get me started. I don't even want to talk about it. Nobody will love Jesus at the end of the TSA thing and then getting to your gate. So I just travel poorly. I, I am so, I hate waiting. Let me just pause. How many hate waiting? How many of you have the gift with me? I mean, you just hate waiting. Okay, so you get this. So Marcia knows I don't travel well. I'm not going to travel well. So let's just not have any meaningful conversation until we get to the gate. Because we have things to do. And we have to do it faster than everybody else. And what is their problem? So when, when we get to the, the Hertz rental car off site, we, you know, we don't just get out our bags. Get your bags out. We got out our heavy bag and then, then, then the, the carry on, you know, luggage. And anyhow, and, and Bobby was there. And I, I got Bobby Hertz guy. I mean, you might not know this. I didn't know this. But in Boston, if you complete the Boston Marathon, you're royalty. Who knew? So Marsha had on her Boston Marathon jacket. And when somebody sees it, oh, did you run the marathon? Yes, I did. They said, oh. Next question, every time to me, did you run? Well, no, I didn't. Well, then I don't exist. 
I, I, am, I am irrelevant as a human being. I'm not even there. I'm there to carry her bags, and that's about it. So that's how Bobby treated her and I, and that's fine, whatever. And, and, and we left, thank you, and we took off. And, and now we find the right bus, and we're at the right bus, and the bus comes, and we're ready to get on the bus. And Marcia looks at me with a panic look. It's like something just rushed over her body. She looked at me. Oh, my goodness. What? I, I, uh, I left my backpack in the back seat. <laughs> you, you what? Now, in that moment, I, I gave her that marriage disdain, <laughs> disgust. I didn't say anything. Just involuntarily, what's going through my head is, how could you? What is wrong with you? Why would you do that to me? You know what we're doing right now. <laughs> There's no forgiveness for this. This is, this is not an option. I, listen, I, it's involuntary. I'm not making myself do this. Myself does this. It's skill. I just say, let's go get it. <laughs> so we turn to rush back. But in one to two seconds, my brain's involuntarily going through these thoughts because I know what's happening. Somebody already, a, a Hertz runner already got in the car and was taking off. Our car is gone. It'll be an hour before we find that car. We will miss the flight. I don't like to wait. What is wrong with you? But I didn't say any of that. It only took, I don't need help here, okay? <laughs> It only took one more second for me to have a moment. And I had a panicked look, and I turned to Marcia. I left my leather bag in the back seat of the car. <laughs> oh, stop it. My precious, my signature leather bag gift that costs more than everything in her backpack, along with my computer and my iPad and all the cash I always travel with just in case. And all of a sudden, I'm like, we got to hurry up. <laughs> I had a Pharisee moment. Say it with me. I had a what? Pharisee. How many of you ever had a Pharisee moment? Come on, let me see it. Come on, hang on. Let me do it again. I saw hands not up. <laughs> this is your Pharisee moment, by the way. I had a Pharisee moment. How many ever had a Pharisee moment? You don't even know what it is, and yet you sort of do. What I had just done is I had just judged my wife and condemned her for the very thing I had done. That's a Pharisee moment. And we looked at each other and just laughed. I mean, after 41 years of marriage, neither one of us are surprised. And we turn around and we start hauling for the rental car that ain't going to be there. And we run into Bobby. Bobby is running to us. Bobby saw it in the back of the car as it was pulling around the corner, stopped the guy. Then said, leave it here, wait, and ran to find us to get us before we got on the bus. <laughs> then, if you think that's good and you're giving it up for Bobby, wait. Then Bobby said to Marcia, you've been running too long this week. Put her in the back seat, loaded our luggage, and had the guy drive us to the airport and drop us off at the terminal. <laughs> hang on, hang on. And then Marcia gave me the smug look. Good to be with royalty, isn't it? Now you can celebrate, Bobby. Now you can celebrate, Bobby. Oh, my goodness. See, see the, and we all understand what a Pharisee moment is. We all raise our hand because we know we're guilty of it. <laughs> and let me just say something. When I say a Pharisee moment and be humble, I don't mean now we drop the standard. That's a huge mistake in this culture. People think, well, because you sin and I sin, we both now confess humbly that we're both sinners. Now we drop the standard and there's no such thing as sin. That's not humble. That's not even helpful. Humble is not dropping the standard of what is holy, good, and right. It doesn't help either of us to celebrate having lost our bags. It's just a spirit and disposition of humility that I give grace instead of judgment. 
Authentic relationships thrive in authentic humility. And we need to know what that looks like. So let me give us the safe and unsafe statements. Today, safe people are harder on themselves and easier on others. And unsafe people are easier on themselves and harder on others. Just stop immediately. Don't you already get it? As soon as I say it, like it doesn't take long to get. Like as soon as I say, oh, safe people, yes, they're harder on themselves than they are on others. They humbly seek to practice what they preach. Unsafe people are easier on themselves and harder on others, washing the outside of their cup rather than the inside. Snap a picture of it, write it down, get it in your head, get it in your heart, men and women. That distinction is what determines in great part First, honesty, now humility. Can you build authentic relationship? You want your marriage to work? Start working on this. You're in a dating relationship? Be working on this. Your family knows dysfunction and breakdown and challenges? Get past this. Get into this. Understand what God is teaching us and how transforming this is. In friendship, in the body of Christ, in community, in co-workers, in all of your relationships, if you want a quality of life that wins, you're going to have to be honest to God about your pharisaical moments and, so to speak, get past them. Now, why do I call them Pharisee moments? <laughs> here's why. Because Jesus talked to the Pharisees. And here's what he wrote. And it's a good bit of scripture. Follow along. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. Oh, you should have practiced the latter. Don't drop the standing. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat, but swallow a cow. Isn't that a picture? Or camel, rather. Isn't that a great picture? You strain a gnat. You know, like you strain a gnat for others, but you'll swallow a camel yourself. You, you, listen, you'll be so gracious with yourself and so judgmental toward others. Anyhow, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence, blind Pharisee. First clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside will also be clean. Now, sometimes to get commentary on Scripture and what Jesus is teaching, sometimes all you need is just another version. We just read the NIV version. Sometimes if you just read something more contemporary, like the message version. So let's read the same thing in the message version for almost commentary to help us absorb it. You're hopeless. This is the same scripture and message. You're hopeless. Jesus says, you, you religion scholars and Pharisees, frauds, you keep meticulous account books, tithing on every nickel and dime you get. But on the meat of God's law, things like fairness and compassion and commitment, the absolute basics, well, you carelessly take it or leave it. Now, careful bookkeeping is, is commendable, but the basics are required. Do you have any idea how silly you look writing a life story that's wrong from the start to finish? Nitpicking over commas and semicolons, you're hopeless. You religion scholars and Pharisees, frauds, you buff the surface of your cups and bowls so they sparkle in the sun, while the inside are maggoty with your greed and gluttony. Stupid Pharisee, scour the insides, and then the gleaming surface will mean something. Whew. Heavy words. See, the Pharisees did not practice what they preach, but they held other people in judgment. Be humble. Look how he starts chapter 23. If that's not arresting enough, he says, the teachers of the law, the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, so you must be careful to do everything they tell you. You don't dismiss what they don't dismiss the truth of the teaching. You have to do that. But do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. And look what he says in verse 12. For those who exalt themselves will be, what everybody? Humble. And those who what? Humble themselves will be exalted. I jotted down in my own notes. See if this helps you. All Jesus is saying is some don'ts. Don't be like the Pharisees. Don't be easier on yourself and harder on others. 
Don't give yourself grace in others' judgment. Don't exalt yourself, rather humble yourself. Don't wash the outside of your cup and pretend you're holy. That kind of self-righteousness makes for unsafe people, unhealthy relationships, and fosters dysfunctional family and friendships. And that's what we see in the Old Testament story of Jacob's son. Remember Abraham, who has the covenant promise of the great land, the great nation, the great Messiah. This trifold promise to Abraham, that covenant transfers from Abraham to his son Isaac, then from Isaac to his son Jacob. Jacob's name is changed to Israel. That's where we get the name the Israelites. Of his sons who became the tribes of the nation of Israel is Judah. If we have time, we'll say more about Judah next week. But today, let's tap into Judah's story in Genesis 38. And as we do, this is not a story that you would usually teach on a Sunday weekend. It can't be told easily. And it's a more, more of a story of where you learn how not to live. Nonetheless, let's get into it. Judah has three sons. See if you can follow the story. The first son marries Tamar. And his first son is wicked before God and loses his life by God's hand. Before Tamar ever becomes a mother. So the custom of the day, she becomes the wife of Judah's second son. Who also did evil before the Lord. And his life was taken before she ever became a mother. So as is custom of the day, because he had a third son, she would become his wife. But he wasn't old enough. So Judah said to her, go back to your father for a season of time. Be a widow in waiting. And when my son is old enough, you'll become his wife. Now there's all sorts of customs of the day you'd have to understand, but you get the picture. However, Judah, when his son grows up, does not give him to Tamar or Tamar to him. He leaves her as a widow in waiting and he breaks his word. He breaks his word. He breaks his promise. Scripture says because he was afraid his third son would die too because the first two guys would go with Tamar and all yeah, they died. He's blaming, listen, he's being dishonest. He's blaming Tamar when it was the wickedness of his sons. If you can't be honest, you can't be humble. He couldn't be honest to God about his own sons and how they lived. So he put it on somebody else. That is a dysfunctional family. But she realized she was left. Now, Judah finds out some years later, after the death of his own wife, and he's a widower, that his daughter-in-law, Tamar, is pregnant, which is not possible. Unless, of course, she broke her word. Therefore, in that day and custom among the Hebrews, the consequence would be death. And he cast judgment because he had the authority to do so. And he said, well, she's forfeited her life. Before the execution could take place, she sends a messenger to Judah. And she says, FYI, the man who impregnated me owns these things. This particular staff and these couple of items, see if they look familiar to you. Plot twist. They were his. And he became honest and humble. He became honest and humble. He became what? Honest. In fact, he said this. Judah recognized them and said, she is more righteous than I. He humbled himself since I wouldn't give her my son, Shelah. Now, pause. Weird, kind of bizarre, dysfunctional story. When she realized that her father-in-law had broken his word, she dressed up as a prostitute knowing she had no future and waited at a particular town when the widower, Judah, was traveling through the town. She wore a veil so he wouldn't recognize. She propositioned him. He accepted the proposition. He gave his personal items as part of the exchange. 
And she was actually impregnated by the man who was judging her for getting pregnant and breaking her word. In other words, he broke his word before she broke her word. Talk about a hot mess. You're like, what on earth are we talking about? Why is he teaching that? What can we learn? You can learn what not to do. <laughs> Sometimes that's helpful. See, <laughs> Judah got humble. He could have got haughty. Most of us do. He had a Pharisee moment or season and got humble. I wrote it this way, just as thoughts. If you want to break the back of dysfunction relationships, be humble. Do a better job judging yourself than judging others. If you want to break the back of dysfunction in relationships, be humble. Be harder on yourself and easier on others. Be humble. Clean the inside of your life rather than polish in the outside. Be humble. Seek to practice what you preach as it is what God preaches. And let me just time out this thing. God is not celebrating Judah breaking his word or Tamar breaking her word. He's not celebrating or justifying their sexual sin. None of it. All of us sin and have made messes of our lives. What God can deal with is humble. Is what? And they became humble. And God opposes the proud but gives grace to the what? Humble. So I want to give us a bit of thought. If safe people are harder on themselves and easier on others, while we remain or retain the standard that God's established, what are some things we can do? And I'm going to give you kind of rapid fire popcorn, a series of thoughts, three in particular, and I'll try and make them accessible. Three things that we can do. You talk to God and see if any of this can be helpful for you. Number one, wash the inside before the outside. Everybody across all the campuses, read this with me loud and proud so we all know we're in the same conversation. Number one, here we go. You ready? Read it with me loud. Wash the inside before the outside. One of the great dangers of becoming a person of faith even, or being in the church, or religious, or anything, which of course we don't like celebrate, or become religious, and always have a relationship with God, but what's at risk is that after a while, under pressure, you start trying to look better than you live. You put more effort looking holy on the outside than you do becoming holy on the inside. And so Jesus gives this imagery of a cup. So imagine you come to a high-class restaurant, and when you sit down for breakfast or dinner, that's the cup at your table. And you call over the waiter or waitress, you're like, are you kidding me? That's disgusting. Can you imagine the waiter or waitress picking up your cup saying, oh, I'm sorry. And then they wipe off the outside and they put it back down and then they pour hot coffee in it. Who's drinking that? I'm not drinking that. Because you're supposed to wash the inside. That's the first thing you care most about. That's all Jesus is saying. Don't wash the outside of your cup so you look good in front of everybody and then pretend like you're in a position of haughtiness and you humble other people because you call out their inside. Listen, don't elevate your outside and call out their inside. Let me say it another way. Don't be impressed with polish. Because we live in a culture that is. Don't be impressed with people's polish. It's what's on the inside that counts. One of the shows I used to love to watch was Street Outlaws. It's just street racers. And among them is Farm Truck. And Farm Truck is a 70s truck with no polish who loves to challenge cars with polish, polish like this Lamborghini. I enjoy this. Maybe you will too. Check it out. Isn't that entertaining? Enough said, right? <laughs> so let the Holy Spirit transform you from the inside out. 
Let the Holy Spirit deal with your fears, your flaws. Let the Holy Spirit deal with your selfish ambition and vain conceit. Let the Holy Spirit deal with your haughtiness and pride. Let him transform you from the inside out. Thoughts, like here's a Seinfeld quote. How does that fit in teaching? You'll see. Don't be proud of things for which you should be ashamed. And don't be ashamed of things for which you should be proud. Or just better scripture. God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. Second, second, let's kind of rapid fire and kind of important, practical, protect your head and heart. Everybody read that with me loud and proud so we know we're on the same page again. You ready? Here we go. Everybody across campuses, even online, right here in the room. You ready? Here we go. Protect your head and heart. Here's, here's what I mean. Jesus, when he was talking to the crowd about the Pharisees in chapter 16, Prior to what we have recorded in chapter 23, he said, stay on guard. Stay on what? Against the Pharisees. What he, what he, we could almost go over here and say, when, when, when I went racing this last Thursday, uh, this is my gear. This is my particular, I mean, this is mine. So, so here's the helmet, and this is designed for, you know, if you have an accident, it's a motorsport helmet and, and, and fire rated, and then this is a fire rated suit. So this is a fire racing suit and, and, and gloves and shoes. Actually, I have the underwear, the socks, everything, and it's all rated so that if, if you have an accident, it, it protects you, but mostly from fire. From what? Fire. Now, now, when I say fire, I'm just going to put a metaphor in this. Just think unsafe people. That's what I'm talking about. But, but illustratively, let me get in this. Because the thing that's most terrifying is fire. And the worst I've ever seen is watching an F1 crash in 2020. When Romain Grosjean had an accident with a Haas car. Or Haas, as some say it. Yeah, I, because he walked away. I want you to check it out. See, perhaps the most terrifying thing in car racing is fire. When the fuel ignites, the race suits are tested and designed to give you up to 12 seconds in a fire before you start in second degree burns and worse, and it just incinerates you. He was in this fire for almost 30 seconds. They concluded temperatures hit 1,830 degrees Fahrenheit. We, we wouldn't take the moment to show this unless something near miraculous occurs because the safety people can't get any closer. The fire's too hot, so they can't put the fire out. The fuel is ignited. They can't get to him. And yet how on earth he crawls out of that is unbelievable, if not crazy. And he has second degree burns on his hands. And that's it. How is that possible? How can you be in that kind of fire? Because he was guarded. He was what? Guarded. In other words, if I want to make the application, as followers of Jesus Christ and as people who want to live in healthy relationship, you're going to have to put on, if you will, God's word, God's helmet, God's fire retardant suit in a world of dysfunction and insanity and lies to stand against what the world is telling you to think and act and feel. You have got to settle in your soul that you're going to put on. Scripture often calls it the full armor of God so that you can stand against the wiles of the evil one. And if you don't put that on, you're in trouble. You let it penetrate your mind and penetrate your thinking and penetrate your head and your heart. You are in trouble trouble. Listen, you can influence the world. You just can't let the world influence you. We're here to influence the world. Don't let them influence you. That's the same with dysfunction and unsafe. I come from a highly dysfunctional family. I literally had to learn eventually and even still in my adult life where the equivalent of this around our family because 
because our extended family, they we can't survive. It, 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 they get in your head and they get in your heart and that cynicism and that pride and that self-righteousness and everything that goes, it's, you just understand the mess that it is. And listen, if you can't keep it from penetrating your mind and your heart, then get distance. But protect your head and your heart. Boy, that needs an hour, but let's go to number three, because that's all we got time for. Get a stopwatch. Everybody say it with me. Do what? Get a stopwatch. We left off last week with this conversation. Very, very, the very thing, the stopwatch. I said, you know what? At some point, you just got to get a stopwatch. What do I mean? Just, just in racing, it doesn't matter how fast I feel. The stopwatch tells the truth. I'm on the track, and I feel fast. I'm like, cool, but that was amazing. And then they show me this stopwatch. I'm like, I'm not that fast. <laughs> Your feelings don't declare the truth. Your feelings need a filter. Well, great, this is how you feel. But now let's have a stopwatch. Great, this is how you feel about something. But what does God's word say? Because it's a stopwatch to tell the truth. It's like a, a weight scale in fitness and in health, when you get on that weight scale, it has no emotion. It just weighs the truth, which is why I say don't get on one. <laughs> why own one? You don't need one of those things. I've decided they're not necessary. <laughs> Same thing with stopwatch. Why do I need that? I felt fast. Good enough. How fast were you? Amazing. What's the stopwatch say? We don't care. Let me just tell you how I feel. You get it? See, racing doesn't work. You're not really racing until you got a stopwatch. And maybe, maybe the most practical thing the Holy Spirit will say to you today is get a stopwatch. Because in Boston, I needed a stopwatch. I had a Pharisee moment. I was being harder on my wife and easier on myself. I was judging her for the very things I do. You want to fix dysfunction in relationship, in marriage, in family, you're in a dating relationship or the like, oh my goodness, get a stopwatch. Judah and Tamar needed a stopwatch. The Pharisees needed a stopwatch. We all do. Oh, it's like us to run from it, but God's word is a stopwatch. And he gives us wisdom. To know how to set in motion and humbly bow to the truth. Because the truth is often humbling and it's limiting and you have to get a framework for it. And this is especially true when you become aware of what's demanded in life and of life. And it was in my 30s that God transformed some things. And they're described in great part by the discovery of Ron Pierceman this comedian and juggler who shares the discovery. It's almost a Father's Day video. Enjoy. I'm going to show you how your life is going to progress. What I wish somebody would have taught me when I was younger. You woke up to your world about age 16. About age 16, you said to yourself for the first time, ah, I need to get a job one day. So I'm going to have to work real hard at a skill to make money, but I want to make a lot of money. So I'm going to work and work and work for years to become an expert at a skill. And then one day out of the blue, you get a relationship. <laughs> now I got to keep the job going because she needs a lot of money. <laughs> then we bought a house. Now I have to be a plumber. I have to be an electrician. I have to be a landscape artist. I have to be an expert at taxes. Now we have children. <laughs> Now I have to be a doctor, I'm a mentor, I'm a theologian, and all of a sudden I hear from my wife, honey, I don't get enough attention. There is no time! <laughs> and that's how your life goes. How about that, huh? Come on, everybody, give it up for him. That's just true. And everybody said amen? Yeah, we all get it. In other words, you're going to be disappointed, and listen very carefully. The number one reason for disappointment in life is unmet expectations. Write it down, understand it, because it is the art of getting relationships right. If you're dating and you're not disappointed in each other, keep dating. 
we all love to watch. <laughs> if you've been married for more than a year, you already know marriage will be disappointing. If you have children, children will be disappointed in parents. Parents will be disappointed in children. You go to church, your church will disappoint you. You'll disappoint your church. You're at work, your employer will disappoint you. Employers will be disappointed with their employees. You know why? Unmet expectations. Because as a rule, we don't even have really good stopwatches. I mean, if you judge everything by what you feel, you're going to spend your whole life in disappointment. Here's what I discovered in my 30s. Relationships have to have the same stopwatch and then keep their word and you'll have the least disappointment in life. It's when God taught me irreducible minimums. It's going to sound odd, but it's one of the biggest breakthroughs in my life when the Holy Spirit taught a thing I call irreducible minimums. What is the minimum I have to do in this area of my life for that to remain healthy? And Marsha and I spent a good bit of time translating God's word where it was specific and where it gave guidance. In some places, we didn't get great guidance from God's word in specifics, so we applied them ourselves. Irreducible minimums are the least I have to do in this area, the least. Now, I can sell them, oh, I want to do more, but this is the least I have to do for that to remain healthy. So in marriage, the absolute irreducible minimum is we date once a week, not once a month, not once every two months, even when we had kids. In fact, more so when we had kids, once a month we need to spend time. If we're going to be in love, we're going to have to spend time. And our finances, for example, the first 10% goes to God. That was biblical. So every month when we settle our accounts, we make sure God gets the first 10%. We don't carry credit card debt after we did at the beginning, discovered what it does. You can't use the credit card unless you have the cash. That's an irreducible minimum for us. I decided when my kids were young, they get put down to bed four nights a week by me because that's the most impressionable season of their life at the most impressionable time of their life. Therefore, I reset my travel calendar and everything I did to be around four nights a week for them, among other things. We worship one every seven days. God set that. So that's an irreducible minimum. We began to set in our relationship with an understanding of God's word. What are the irreducible minimums from the values of God? And then we humbly seek to put those into practice. A stopwatch. Keep your word. You see, healthy relationships thrive from humble. So here's the practice. Be humble which means own your stuff and humbly seek to practice what you preach.